All right, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Jen Bokoff. I am the Director of Stakeholder Engagement at Candid, and I'm here with our President Brad Smith and Executive Vice President Jacob. We are in different locations because of the fabulous weather outside, and that's just part of how we're going to be working. Um, we're still in several offices across the country, and we're connecting a lot like this, face-to-face, -face, and that's how we want to be connecting with you as well. Um, it's, it's the Candid style, and so we want this conversation to really represent uh, a transparency of information and conversation, and so hopefully you'll feel excited to join in with your questions as we go. Um, how do you do that? Well, you can just type it into the question box. I think it is actually labeled question box. Uh, it's on the right of your screen. Feel free to ask questions as we go, and I'm going to be integrating them um, both as we go, and at the end, we'll also have some focus time for Q&A. We also got about 30 questions leading up to the webinar, so we'll be integrating that as well. Um, other thing you might be wondering, are we recording? Yes, we are. So if you missed something, you can go back and watch this again and again. Um, last thing is feel free to tweet during this webinar. We are at candid.org. Um, a, a pro tip for any nonprofit here who's going to be changing their Twitter handle, do not make your birthday February 5th, 2019, because then you will be a baby tweeting and you will be kicked off of Twitter. So this is the type of expertise we're excited to share with you and more. Um, but let's, uh, let's, let's actually talk about the context of why we're here. So on February 5th, we publicly announced that GuideStar and Foundation Center joined forces um, in what's a really exciting merger in the nonprofit and philanthropic infrastructure space. Um, so we've been for a couple of weeks now functioning as one organization. Uh, our teams have been really excited to be connecting and figuring out where we, where we immediately join what we're doing, where we work in parallel, and how we start connecting dots so that we can really grow what we're able to offer to you all. And so we certainly have a lot of excitement, we have a lot of vision, um, and we hope that you're on board and excited for that as well. But we also know that this is new, and new things and change, especially when you bring two of the most longest standing organizations in the field, when that comes together, it's, there's a lot of questions. What does that mean for me? How does that affect my organization? And so our goal for today's webinar is to have an open conversation that will hopefully answer a bunch of your questions and leave you feeling really energized about what's to come. Um, and just to kick before I turn it over to Brad and Jacob for conversation, uh, let's do a poll. Um, we have Arielle on the back end. Thank you, Arielle. She's going to pull up a poll. I just want to get a pulse of the room. Um, what are your initial thoughts about Candid? Uh, is this exciting? Is it business as usual? Maybe you're not sure. Or are you in panic mode? Let's see. We're going to leave it up for a couple of seconds more. Arielle, whenever you feel like folks are in, feel free to... Show us the results. Oh, yeah, still not sure. Cool, 58% of you are still not sure. I'm delighted that only 1% is in panic mode. Um, and if you are in panic mode, I really hope to change that by the end of this. And if not, we'll talk. Um, and yeah, there's also some excitement. So uh, with that, I kind of want to turn it over. Jacob, let's start with you. Tell us a little bit about where you've been in this field. Um, and what you're excited about. Um, sure, thank you, Jen. And I, I'm so glad to be here with you and, and with Brad and to have this virtual conversation with, with you and I here in DC and Brad in the New York Candid office. Um, and you know, I will make this personal for me. Uh, and it goes back to my first job out of college, which was in the environmental movement, an organization called Green Corps. Um, and through that, and over the next several years, I got to know the nonprofit community that was working to address environmental issues. And it was an extraordinary experience, but there were a few things I came away with. One, these organizations were doing an immense amount of good. Two, the best ones were not necessarily the ones who were raising the most money. Three, um, the organizations were not doing a good job collaborating with each other. And four, that um, there wasn't a ton of learning that was efficiently happening among organizations. And so since then, I've spent the last 18, 19 years thinking about these problems and trying to figure out what can we do to address them? How do we help 
the broader community of people trying to make a better world in nonprofits, in foundations, and other kinds of institutions more effective. Um, and you know, through experience at, at the Hewlett Foundation, um, it, it led me to, gui to GuideStar as one piece of that puzzle, um, as an institution that could help to share the story of individual nonprofits that were uh, trying to do good in the world and help to address some of these questions of learning, of collaboration, of the efficient flow of, of money. But even that wasn't a full enough picture. Um, and you know, when I looked around the field and I saw the work that the Foundation Center was doing, it really started to round out the picture for me. Um, and so to me, the birth of Candid is uh, an opportunity for us to really tackle this full picture of the structural challenges that we face in the social sector um, and very real ways we can actually address them. Um, not immediately, but over time. And that the combined staff, resources, networks, communities of these two organizations offer an opportunity, I think, to the field to do something that um, a lot of us have noticed for a long time um, and to address some of these challenges in, in some new ways. Cool, thank you. And Brad, what's what's your angle on all this? Well, I've been around the sector for a long time, okay? Um, and actually I started out in the non, uh, working for a nonprofit. I worked for the YMCA uh, in Costa Rica and then in the headquarters when it was then in New York. Uh, but after about eight or nine years at the YMCA, uh, I went into foundation work, first with a government-sponsored foundation. I spent 15 years in the Ford Foundation, five of them in Brazil, 10 of them in the headquarters, and then uh, three years in Europe working with the uh, Oak Foundation uh, in Geneva, Switzerland, a foundation that funds projects in 41 countries. So, you know, I'd seen the sector from a lot of different perspectives. I'd been in nonprofits, I'd worked uh, overseas, I was in foundations, different types of foundations, government, private, family, uh, supporting uh, nonprofits, making grants. And I really reached a point in my career, you know, where I thought, well, I can go work for one more nonprofit or I can work for one more foundation. But maybe this is the time to think about how I could give something back to the sector. And it seemed like it was the right moment in time to deal with technology and data. And the Foundation Center offered an incredible opportunity to do that. I knew the Foundation Center through my work at the Ford Foundation and other places, but you don't really know an organization until you're actually inside it. And it turned out to be much more exciting and much more interesting than I ever could have dreamed of. And this idea, which had been brewing, we'll get into that, I think, further on, but had been brewing for quite some time to somehow bring together GuideStar and Foundation Center into one organization just seemed like an opportunity which is too good to pass up. So here we are, we did it. Yeah, we did it and we still have a lot to do. But um, I, I think one thing I'm pulling out of, of both of your introductions is that you both came from this field. You both bring a really rich experience and different perspectives um, from the nonprofit and funder side. And so with that in mind, I'm curious, like what what is the problem that we're trying to solve as Candid? Um, we're sort of this meta nonprofit where we are of the field, but also for the field. So, so what is it exactly that we're trying to solve? You know, I'll offer a couple of thoughts. First is that I bet every single person on this call, we're now at 936 people who have joined us today, which is great. Welcome all, thank you. I bet everyone has a story like the ones that Brad and I just told of their own life experiences, trying to do good in the world, um, the successes they've had and the barriers that they've faced. Um, and Candid is not gonna be able to solve every problem or overcome every barrier. But there are a set of problems that are just about explaining who's doing what where, um, about information flowing in an efficient manner, about people being able to get answers to basic questions that we can solve um, and that technology helps us solve. And that the, the vast user bases of both GuideStar and Foundation Center tell us there's a demand for those kind of basic services. Now, it's easy to call them basic. Turns out there's a lot of work that goes into actually making them happen. Um, but fundamentally, Candid is about be operating at a scale and operating at a sense of multidimensionality. And by that, I just mean information about many different aspects of the social good that can actually address those basic needs that people, that the, everyone on this call has um, to understand what's going on in the world to try to make it better. 
And Brad, you talked a little bit before about uh, the history. This has been brewing for quite some time. Um, it was certainly a very thought out combining of operations. Can you give us like quick context of when did it start and how did we get here? Yeah, it's actually, this is sort of, when we look at this, it's kind of like a, a slow motion process of bringing two organizations together. And we had a huge advantage, right? Because we're not private sector companies. We don't have a stock price. There's no hostile takeovers. So there was no reason really to keep this under wraps. So this was a very slow, deliberate process. It actually started in early 2009 when Bob Ottenhoff was the head of GuideStar and we agreed to get together. The two CEOs of Foundation Center and GuideStar had never really gotten together formally to sort of talk shop. And we quickly agreed that there was a lot to be gained by trying to work together. Those conversations evolved. And in 2012, we actually brought in a consulting firm to try to make the case for merging the two organizations. And I remember the day the consultants came back to us and they said, you know, we're really disappointed because we thought it was a no brainer. And our recommendation is not so fast. You're more different than we thought. You actually serve different audiences. You're complementary in lots of ways, but it's probably not worth actually joining the two organizations now, but here's what you can do to work together. So we started on a very deliberate path of working together. We developed joint projects. We did some outsourcing together of extraction of data from 990 forums, all sorts of kind of geeky things together. And what that did is it allowed us to establish trust at different levels, not just between the CEOs, but tech teams, program people. And when in 2017, when we brought back these same consultants, Jacob by that time um, was well ensconced as the head of GuideStar had put that organization through a big change. We brought back the consultants and the consultants said, this time it makes a lot of sense. And it makes sense because both organizations have really transformed under leadership. The world around you is changing and something really big for us and everybody on this call was the fact that the 990 tax returns that were electronically filed by nonprofits and foundations had finally been made available as machine readable open data. And that changed the whole landscape of what could be done with information. So we decided this was the time to do it. Our boards were involved. We entered in a deliberate process. And as Jen, as you said, February 5th, we sort of had, a, we came out to the public as candidate. So we have all this information. Um, it's growing every day. Uh, what is your vision for what we're gonna do with that information that we couldn't do as two separate organizations? Well, let me just start one thing and let Jake compliment on it. I think, um, you know, why is this important? Um, as you noted, we've both been around the sector a long time and in different roles, nonprofits, foundations, domestic, international. And if you work in the sector, I think all of us run into two really big questions that are surprisingly difficult to answer. So who's doing what where? It's very difficult to get an overview of who's working on a particular issue in a given geography or anywhere in the world. And the other thing is how can I know what other organizations already know? So the first question has a lot to do with really organizing the information about all the different types of organizations and making that, that information searchable by issues, by geography and other things. The second question really is about knowledge transfer. There is a, a chronic loss of knowledge in our sector. Individually, nonprofits and foundations have enormous learning, enormous experience. They know a lot about the issues they work on but a lot of that issue remains sort of siloed in their individual organizations. And the social sector is way too important in the world to not function somehow as more than the sum of its parts. So the big broad brushstroke is we wanna help the sector function as more than some of its, the sum of its parts. Anything you wanna add? Yeah, so I mean, that's exactly right. And, and so the question is, what can we as Candid do to help make that happen? Um, and it fundamentally does, it comes down to the flow of information, and that is our role in the field is to facilitate that, that flow. And, but how? Um, so one is, and I mentioned this before, this idea of multi-dimensional understanding of a social problem. And by that I mean, if you look at, at GuideStar as an organization, we were focused on one nonprofit at a time. 
an incredibly important angle on understanding how social change happens. Foundation Center had a variety of different perspectives, but much of it was focused on understanding grants as a unit of analysis. Um, but there are so many different elements that can be brought together. Think about knowledge, as Brad said. You know, Foundation Center has pulled together more than 30,000 research reports through its Issue Lab database that begins to capture, to answer that question of what do people already know? Um, you cross-reference that with information about issues, the great challenges of our time, whether it's poverty or addressing the achievement gap uh, or climate change. You bring that together with the organizational issue, the grants, um, uh, the, the grants information, the organizational information, you begin to get that what we call 360 degree view of a social problem or opportunity. Um, so that is one piece of it, um, is to pull together these different streams of information that between the two organizations, we actually have a lot of it already, but to use that to tell a whole story. Um, a second piece is, it's not quite as exciting, but it's arguably as important, which is just the pure question of efficiency. That right now, people in the social sector waste a whole lot of time filling out dozens and dozens of different profiles, proposals, templates. Um, and there's partially the, the loss of time. You're just writing the same thing over and over again. But more importantly, there's the loss of understanding that that information is so fragmented throughout the field. Um, and we believe that by combining the networks of GuideStar and Foundation Center, we're able to create a new kind of efficiency in the flow of information. Much of that will happen through the use of data standards, a basic framework for organizing information. And you know, a metaphor that we often use is of a nutrition label. A nutrition label is a basic data standard for organizing information about packaged food. Um, and it allows us to look at a nutrition label and make quick decisions, even if everyone who looks at the nutrition label may bring a different question. One person may say, how many calories? The next person might say, how much vitamin C? I'm feeling a little sick. The third person might say, can I actually pronounce every ingredient? And everyone is able to do that very quickly because of the standardization of how that information is presented. Um, and you actually reveal the diversity across food with that standardization. And so we can do that with information about different aspects of social change. And along the way, I believe save quite literally billions of dollars in wasted time and effort across the social sector. Um, and then thirdly, I think together we are far better positioned to look not just at the social sector within the United States, but around the world. Now uh, we are fully aware of the fact that um, the nonprofit sector, philanthropy, private action for public good plays out in very different ways in different contexts around the world. Um, and applying an American model to other uh, regions is not gonna work. But we also think that there's enough commonality across these different experiences and enough experience that we and others have gained that we should really start moving towards a true representation of global civil society uh, and the role that it plays in the, in the human experience. And we believe that together we'll be able to do that. Um, there are a lot of other things, but to me that gets to how we are able to translate this desire to have the whole be greater than the sum of its parts into concrete products, projects, programs that we'll be running as candidates. Awesome. So let's pick up on that and, and drill in a little more products, programs, services, other tools. Like what can our audience expect to see happen? now and also over the next couple of years? How are we gonna be reimagining and also continuing uh, everything that we've provided in the past? Yeah, I'll, I'll start with a few thoughts and, and hand it over to Brad on this. The first thing to say is that the existing products and programs are going to continue. Um, and that we've already gotten some questions about exactly that. That we know there are millions of people who rely on the tools we already have, whether it's Foundation Directory Online or GuideStar Pro or Charity Check. Um, to help them in their day-to-day -day work in the social sector. So that is all gonna continue. Um, and over time, we are gonna need to listen to the field to really think about how do we prioritize all of the different ways that we could strengthen those products, but also bring them together. So for example, to bring in the richer data that GuideStar has on individual nonprofit organizations into the Foundation Directory Online tool um, that, that Foundation Center brings to Candid which is used by, uh, by grant seekers to, to figure out which foundations are funding what, where. 
um, and to begin to say, well, we can't, we, we're going to tell you not just about the foundations, but about the nonprofits that they are funding. And what can you learn from them? That immediately can enrich that experience, just as um, the GuideStar experience can be immediately enriched with some of the great tools that Foundation Center has built to auto code, and we can talk about what that really means, um, individual organizations against a taxonomy or a categorization of different issues so that it's much easier to find every organization that's working on education in a particular geography than it might be now. So one of the tricky things that we're gonna to have to navigate is capturing some of those quick wins, those obvious places where the two organizations are immediately complementary and we can, in a few months work, capture that. Versus a much longer term set of questions of what does the field need for the next several decades? Um, and how do we build tools that integrate all these different aspects in a way that, that is as powerful as it, as it could be. And so that's just going to be a really um, an, an ongoing tension for us, um, but one that we think can be very, very productive. Brad, what would you add? Well, I think you know, in the near future, people that use our tools are going to begin to see um, richer information and more comprehensive information being included in those tools as we begin to sort of cross-populate the tools with the information of, of both organizations. Um, an important thing about, um, you know, to understand about Candid is like whenever you're, anybody who's ever designed a website has always been asked the question by the designers, well, do you see this as a destination site? And we don't see ourselves as purely a destination site. We obviously, people do come to our main sites and our sub sites for information, but part of our strategy and we'll, be, we'll double down on it going forward, is to make sure that this really rich, deep information we have about nonprofits, funders, causes, and social actors uh, flows through lots of other kinds of organizations and platforms in which people access information. So what do I mean by that? Well, it could be, for example, uh, an, an affinity group, a group of foundation funders like the Human Rights Funding Network. So their members have access to comprehensive information on what philanthropy is doing to support human rights around the world. Another would be Amazon Smile or Facebook, where you'll there's a, a stream of data that goes in there, which we want to enrich by some of the things Jacob was talking to about coding and some other techniques, so that people that want to identify a nonprofit for some percentage of their Amazon purchases to go to or want to create a campaign on Facebook for their favorite nonprofit, will have a much richer experience in searching for the information. They're not going to have to know in advance the exact organization they want to mobilize support for, but they're going to be able to say, for example, you know, I'm really interested in funding animal rescue operations in Arkansas, Alabama, and Mississippi. And you can get back different options for doing that that you can pick and then you can find out about those organizations that build your campaign around it. So if you imagine the way this information, all the places that people get information they need in the social sector, we want a lot of our information to be there. It's already in a lot of those places, but it can be much more and we can improve the quality of that information by bringing the, the joint power of the organizations together. So, so it sounds like you're talking about making this data and information available outside of what we're calling the sector, which we might talk about as nonprofits or philanthropy. It, it's something bigger. Who's Candid meant for? Who's our data meant for? Yeah, we, we've, yeah we, we've been trying to use this sort of notion of the social sector. And one of the most interesting things about the time in which we live is, you know, that, that the world that was once sort of inhabited by, you know, uh, ATM foundations, which were like ATM machines, and nonprofits, which did the work, that really doesn't hold. There's still lots of nonprofits and lots of foundations that make grants, but increasingly you have social enterprises, B Corps, uh, corporate social responsibility. You have all these different you know, LLCs instead of traditional foundations. You have all these different forms of organizations and social action that are contributing to doing good. And one of the also really fascinating and I think exhilarating things about our time is that it's getting increasingly more difficult to draw borders around problems. So we also wanna know and synergize the, 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 the action 
of organizations and social enterprises and social whatever around the world. And this information you know, can allow you to do that by tying these different streams of information together. So yes, it's nonprofits. Yes, it's foundations. Those are big audiences for us. But it's also other kinds of organizations and individuals that are trying to contribute to the public good using private resources, researchers, students, journalists. Um, we live, we're really privileged to work in a sector. We, we live and work in a hot sector. This is a sector that's growing. The social sector is a place that people increasingly want to make their professional life because they want to actually contribute something to the world. And that's, that's definitely a, you know, a wave that we want to surf. And I'll just add, I think that's all exactly right. And it brings some challenges that, you know, how do you design a web interface that is going to make sense for a, an academic researcher and someone who runs a tiny little nonprofit and a foundation program officer and a journalist and a corporate executive? Um, they bring different needs, even if they are part of a common effort to make a better world. Um, and so that creates a real challenge for us. Um, that's part of why we have built a variety of different tools to address different use cases. But it's also why, to Brad's point, we think it's so important to have partnerships with other distribution tools. Um, because those tools, Facebook or Amazon, they know how their user is using information in that context. And they can customize how they're presenting the data that they get from us in a way that makes sense in that moment. Um, and so it allows us to decentralize some of that decision making. Um, through partnership. And it's also worth noting that allows us to reach a lot more people. Um, a story I like to tell was a, a very humbling moment when a few years ago I was having brunch with a friend who worked at Google and I was bragging about um, GuideStar's scale. At the time we had 3 million users a year. We're up to about 10 million now on GuideStar's properties, 17 million for all of Candid. Um, and I said 3 million a year and my friend at Google smiled and said, we have that many every minute. Um, and it was just a reminder that, um, you know, having a website, even with a lot of users, is not enough in the modern economy. Having people come to you to a destination site, as Brad said, is not enough. You have to figure out how to go to them. Um, and we've made some progress there, but we have a lot more, um, a lot more room to do more pushing data to people instead of just assuming they'll come to us. Well, and I think you're starting to get at my next question, which uh, a lot of folks are typing in about, which is, are, are we monopolizing data or in, our, in doing so, are we making it harder for smaller, maybe grassroots organizations and, and people in more remote access um, places around the globe? Are we making it harder for them to access information or is it the opposite? I mean, I would say it's the opposite. I think that the infrastructure that we are providing um, is, can be profound, profoundly democratizing. So, you know, the amount of space that the tiniest little volunteer-driven nonprofit gets in GuideStar's database um, and now in Candid's database is exactly the same that, that, that a giant billion dollar nonprofit gets. So it, it can be democratizing in, in terms of allowing those smaller organizations to have the same access to the same in, uh, information infrastructure, the same channels, Facebooks, Amazons, and others that, that use our data. Um, and so I, I think it can be very democratizing. However, I think it's something that we need to pay a lot of attention to and ensure that we are spending a lot of time, just as we are today, sharing what we're thinking, listening to questions, bringing in other perspectives uh, to ensure that the decisions we are making are informed by those, um, uh, those that we affect. Yeah, I think the, the whole question comes up a lot, you know, will this become in some way monopolize the data? Well, I, there's some really important things to understand. And, one is that a lot of the core data still of both organizations comes from 990 tax returns. And as I said before, all those electronically filed are now available as machine readable open data on AWS. So anybody that has cloud storage can plug into AWS and download all those 990s. And then they'll have to deal with them because they're kind of messy and disorganized and whatnot. But all that information is publicly available for free. Um, the data sources, other data sources that we tap into are similar databases in other parts of the world. It could be Canada, it could be India, it could be China, it could be Brazil, but these are essentially open databases about the social sector. So that core data is open and free. 
the value add we bring to it is really what requires the scale to do. So I think it's much more a story of scale rather than monopoly um, to really try to, to try to capture and portray what the sector is doing on the issues that matter in the world requires scale because it requires technology. It requires a lot of storage to store all that information. Today, that's cloud storage and a lot of pretty sophisticated techniques to actually mine that information to get people answers they need. So, you know, an interesting example from the Foundation Center, um, we used to uh, code all grants over of the top thousand foundations, all grants over a certain amount of money. And we coded by saying, you know, this is about education, this is about health, this is for children, um, this is for young boys, this is for young girls. Those kinds of coding was attached. We can only do 250,000 grants a year because we were limited. The sector makes something like 5 million grants, it's the foundation side. Once we started to machine process all the machine learning, we actually democratized the information because the main critique we had before was that I'm a small nonprofit in Kansas. I'm a small nonprofit in Idaho. And frankly, what the Hewlett Foundation, the Ford Foundation, and the Gates Foundation are doing doesn't really interest me because they're not making grants in my community. What interests me are the small grants that are going to all the small nonprofits. So this is an example where scale and technology actually made it possible to provide much better information to small organizations all over the US and increasingly around the world that otherwise wouldn't have access to it. So I, I want to zoom out a little bit to the brand Candid, uh, which is a, a new brand. Um, there's a lot of questions, first of all, about um, for each of you, Brad, are you scared about losing Foundation Center and Jacob? Are you scared about losing the brand equity of GuideStar? Um, so, so I'm curious to have you talk a bit about that, but also beyond that, what is the Candid brand? What does it mean to you? Um, and th there's been a few questions coming in around like marketing that brand. Like, what are we going to see? Um, what does the Candid brand kind of feel like? I, well, okay, we're, we're not, we're biased, right? But uh, we're totally we, love biased. we love it. <laughs> and I think it's really important for a number of reasons. Uh, one is because really to bring two organizations together, there really can't be winners and there can't be losers. Um, this is about creating something together that's more powerful than either one of us operating separately. So we found a new common identity through an incredibly participatory process. Um, what is kind of remarkable about that is that it's actually a word in the English language. It's not sort of an invented pseudo Latin word. Um, the, 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 actually the logo is the word with a period after it, candid. Um, so it's a real word in the English language. And for a single word, it does an enormous amount of work. And I'll just give you two or three reasons why I feel that way. One is because it communicates quite clearly the historical approach that's deep within the DNA of both organizations in terms of the way we approach information about the sector. We try to be accurate, we try to be fair, and we try to be objective in telling the story of what the social sector is doing around the world. Um, we don't pick winners, we don't pick losers, we don't tell people who to fund, who they should not fund. We report the work as it is. And that comes from deep within our roots um, of both organizations. Um, the second thing is I think it speaks uniquely to the importance of candid information uh, in an information wary world. Um, the Foundation Center was born before the internet. The, the uh, GuideStar was created almost simultaneously with the internet. Fast forward to today, we're, we're drowning in information and there's growing suspicion of that information and the people that provide it and the accuracy of what you're coming, you're finding online. So this idea of being accurate and being candid and being forthright is really strong. And in terms of how we use it, um, as we actually began to use it and think about it, it got even more exciting. Like the GuideStar puts out a, a report on nonprofit compensation. So imagine the candid report on nonprofit compensation. I mean, it works, it does a lot of work for one word. I mean, you think it really in 
a very short space captures an awful lot about the ethos of our, you know, our previous organizations and our new organization. And I'll just add that it also is a reminder for us, and by us I mean, you know, the entire Candid family, staff, board, friends, partners, that, you know, we've been talking today about the what, um, but that the how matters. Uh, and that our ability to manifest in the way that we do our work, a set of principles like Brad just laid out, will be important to our success in actually executing our plan. Um, and yeah. I think it forces us to step up to that. Um, that's you know sometimes a little scary, but I think it's a great challenge that we've laid for ourselves. Cool. Yeah, really interesting example of that, Jen, is I know with the people that work with uh, Foundation Directory Online here at Foundation Center, um, they were very excited when they heard the name because they say that when customers are calling in that have questions about the product or questions about the data, they say, what turns that conversation around is when they say, look, let me be frank with you. Anybody who tells you their data is perfect is, is not telling you the truth. So that's a candid moment that completely shifts the relationship. So I think it's a good example of what, what Jacob is talking about. It also requires us to be sometimes being brutally honest about what our data can say and what it can't. What, you know, to what extent it can answer a question or what it can't and where we're falling short and how we need to get better. Absolutely. So I want to, I'm looking at the time and I want to start making sure that we're answering people's very specific at times questions. Um, so I'm going to start rattling some off in groupings. But while I do that, I also want to invite our listeners to, now that you've heard a bit more about Brad and Jacob's vision, um, we also want to hear your vision. And while we don't want to unmute a thousand of you, um, we would love to listen um, in the chat window. So for anyone who would like, um, while we continue the conversation and answer the questions you've been sending in, we invite you to share in the chat box what your vision for Candid is. Um, and if you're on Twitter, feel free to share it there as well. And we'll be listening to that input um, and more over the next several um, weeks and months to help shape that vision even further. Um, so I want to just start by like answering a big question, like will things that we can currently freely access still be free? Yes. Yes. Brad, what are some of those things that people can access for free? Just to give a little sampling. It's really important to know a lot of people don't understand this, but um, more than 99% of the people that access uh, information of both organizations, guys are in the Foundation Center, do so for free. Um, and there is so much information. We're talking about petabytes of information. Um, a lot of times what they're accessing is something for free that's very related to their issue. It might be ocean conservation. It could be human rights. It could be peace and security. It could be lots of different things. It could be how to write a grant proposal, um, how to construct a budget. But also, and really important, is uh, apart from the heavy web presence Candid has, we also have something which we're very proud of, which is a funding information network, which is over 400 physical locations, mostly public libraries and community-based organizations across the country and in several countries around the world where anyone can come in and use the highest level subscription data tools for free and actually have a person there help guide them on how to do it. Now, currently that is foundation centers, uh, subscription tools like Foundation Director Online, but we wanna move quite quickly to make a lot of GuideStar tools available with that same service. So that's a way we can really reach deep into communities that otherwise just don't have access to these kinds of resources. Great. Uh, Jacob, what's happening with the SEALs, the GuideStar SEALs? Do people have to, number one, update their profile, um, or is their profile information still going to be there? And two, if they've earned a SEAL, do they still have it? Yeah. So for, for anyone who doesn't know, um, a important part of GuideStar's platform is to, to supplement the data that we get from government sources with data directly from nonprofits so that they're able to tell their own story to go beyond the kind of questions that are asked on a tax form to talk about goals, strategies, results. Um, and more than 150,000 nonprofits have shared at least some data with about, at this point, I think we're at 68,000 um, that have achieved one of our transparency seals. 
Now, it's worth noting, these, are, these seals just show that an organization has provided additional information. They are no guarantee that a particular organization is high performing. But we do believe that being able to articulate your goals and strategies and results is a strong proxy. It's correlated with your ability to actually achieve those results. Um, so that's been a very important um, mechanism to help nonprofits tell their own story um, for a whole variety of different audiences. And the short answer is there's really only one organization that had to change its profile, and that's Candid. <laughs> we had to change our profile. Everything else is staying as is. Um, the profiles are still up. We are adding hundreds more uh, every week. Um, and you know, we want to continue with that. Um, you know, over time, we may make some t slight tweaks to that, but that is as is um, because that's we see that as a central part of our strategy uh, going forward. Um, there were a few clarifying questions about do we have to go to our library to get everything for free? And the answer is no. There's a no, lot that no. you can access for free at your home computer. Um, Grant Craft, which I'm partial to as I've run that the last several years, um, that's an example of one of many platforms um, that you can get. And what we'll do in our follow-up communication um, to this webinar for everyone who registered, we'll be sending out a follow-up email that can um, direct you to a lot of those freely available resources. Um, there was also another question that I can field, which is how do you plan to communicate changes um, as they are made. Um, and the answer is really like, we aim to be really transparent with you. So we're going to be using our email lists, our blogs, our social media, and hopefully a lot more candid conversations like these um, to tell you about any changes and also the story behind those changes. Um, but we also hope that any changes that pop up are because we've been listening to you. So it's all gonna be part of a feedback loop process and we really, we're listening. So we're not gonna be making any big changes in the short term because we want you to continue accessing everything as you have been. Um, I actually have gotten a couple chats in during this from people who teach using our resources and they're asking, for example, most immediately, do I have to change my curriculum? Um, you know, are any of the resources gonna, gonna shift or evolve? And the answer is like, no, um, please keep teaching using our resources. We love hearing that. And as things change, the user experience is gonna be top priority um, and we'll make sure to communicate that to you. Um, there's a lot of questions that aren't logistical though, and they're, they're a little bit more philosophical. Um, so there have been a few questions uh, that, that center around, like we still don't know a lot about foundations. There's still a lot of information that they aren't sharing. Uh, do you think that Candid um, and your plans to evolve everything that we do, is it gonna encourage greater transparency by foundations? And I'll extend that question just to anyone who's actively funding. Yeah, um, well, let's start with foundations, all right? Uh, foundations, uh, I think different things will encourage greater transparency. I mean, one of the things I always tell foundation people when I'm talking to them, as I said, you know, well, transparency you know, has numerous advantages, one, it, it helps make you more effective to the extent that you understand what other foundations are doing, what other nonprofits are doing, you can more effectively allocate your dollars. Um, the second thing is as intrinsic value for foundations which receive a tax exemption um, for, from the government in exchange for a stream of charitable giving. And the third is that regardless of how you feel personally about transparency in today's world, it's becoming increasingly inevitable. So I think the the kind of unbiased, uh, accurate, fair information that Candid will be putting out more and more and more about foundations, who they fund, who they are, the choices they make, their limitations, not only in this country and around the world, together with the push for more and more open data in this country and around the world, the continuing breakneck pace of the evolution of technology will all serve to produce more information about foundations. And we actually have under development a number of technologies um, that involve different types of machine learning to extract information about what foundations and corporations and individuals are, are giving money for 
from sort of non-traditional data sources like huge streams of news or looking at hundreds of thousands of social media feeds and extracting information from that and putting it out in almost real time. So I think there's a lot of ways in which this information will become more transparent. And I think we will play a big part in it by accurately reporting it. The one thing I'll add is this connects to what we were talking about earlier of partnerships to help share the data. And you know, when I mentioned the 150,000 nonprofits that have proactively made a choice to share more than they have to legally, tens of thousands of those have come to us directly from Amazon or Facebook or one of these partnerships. As organizations come to understand that the way they are portrayed um, in the platform economy is something they have control over. Yeah. It creates a real incentive for people to be transparent and own their own story. Um, and that's not just for a nonprofit that's raising money, it's also for a foundation that is existing in society. And so the more that we're able to weave this together and to offer people a chance to control at least part of their own story, I, I think the more we'll see that kind of proactive sharing. Cool. So as, as part of this merger process, um, what did we do and what do you want to do going forward to make sure that diverse audiences are at the decision-making table and how will that, how will that um, reach our audience and not just those big foundations and the people who you might think are always at the table? How do we make sure everyone is included in, in the work and iteration that we'll be doing? Yeah, I mean, that's a, a, a hard and essential question for us okay. going forward. Um, and you know, we have a special opportunity over the next couple of years as we integrate and, and talk about our longer term plan as candid. And that opportunity is to go out to our constituents and listen to them. Um, and you know, th this very webinar is an example of that, but we need to do far more. Um, the good thing is that we have these built in networks to help us do that. That we have these 400 plus libraries and community centers that can serve as a way for us to hear directly from, um, uh, from our users, and not just our users, but other stakeholders who are affected by us. We have 17 million users. Um, we have a network of, of offices around the, the country. So what we have to do is actually use those networks um, and, and to listen. Now, at the same time, we have to then make our own judgments about how to, to synthesize all that input and do what we think is best for our missions, our mission singular. Um, and so it's not a perfect process, and we recognize the immense responsibility that we have to try to bring in those voices and then to try and make sense of it um, and to try and ensure that the voices we're bringing in are diverse across multiple different axes, um, across race, gender, sexual orientation, geography, age, politics, introversion versus extroversion, um, it, you know, language that there are so many different um, aspects of human identity that are relevant to how people interact with the tools and services that we provide. So are we going to be doing anything with outcomes or impact measurement or predictive analytics? Everyone wants to know. <laughs> I'll take predictive <laughs> analytics and let Jacob talk about impact and outcomes. Uh, the predictive analytics, yes. Uh, one of the challenges that we have um, is that since the the core data still, meaning what, what I mean by core data is sort of the majority of the data that both organizations are now bringing together into Candid is derived from a lot of blood, sweat, and tears dealing with 990 tax returns. There's a time lag involved in 990s. It has to do with the, the period organizations have to file them, how long they sit in, in the Internal Revenue Service, how long it takes to get them onto Amazon Web Services, and then how long it actually takes to then turn them into usable data and pump them through products and services and interfaces. So what does that mean for the you know, people listening today? It means that a lot of what you're looking at when you're looking at the sector is what the sector was doing several years ago based on, on what the data tells us. So one of the ways that we can get around that is this contributed data, but also by filling gaps and holes in the data with using predictive analytics. And we have enough historical data 
between both organizations without getting into too much technological detail, we can create very large training sets in which to train algorithms that can be, be, to answer questions like, okay, well, what is education? What is health? What is animal rescue giving um, going to be next year? Or what is it this year, even if we don't have all the data exactly from this year? So there's a lot of other ways we can use predictive analytics that we're being to look at um, to uh, get better insights into the data. But outcomes and effectiveness, Jacob? Sure. Yeah, you know, you think about you know, why do nonprofits and foundations exist? Um, and there really are two reasons. And the first one is that the, the social sector is, is an expression of pluralism. It's a manifestation of the diversity of human society. Um, the other reason is that it gets results. Um, and um, both of those, I think, are legitimate. But on that latter one, you know, donors and policymakers and journalists want to understand the lasting impact created um, by nonprofits and foundations. Um, and they're right to want that. And it, most importantly, nonprofits and foundations want to understand their own impact. Um, and we have, but we also recognize that that is not something that can be defined in any single way. Um, that it has to reflect the, the vast diversity of the different kinds of things that that these organizations are trying to accomplish. That those operate on different time horizons. That work to address an issue like climate change might not really have the lasting impact for a decade. Uh, but a homeless shelter that provides someone a bed and a warm meal, um, you know, they're creating an impact that night. And both of those are important. Um, so what we need to be able to do as a field is to represent that diversity, but do so in a way that's much clearer and more consistent than we have in the past. And I think we've made some real strides in that direction. And, and there are many thousands of organizations that have shared their programmatic metrics. And by programmatic, I mean relating to the actual programs of the nonprofit, not only its finances and operations. Um, and, you know, about a third of those, depending on how you count, are, have been outcome metrics. Um, and so that's a big step in the right direction. Uh, a lot of our partners really want to see that kind of data. So we think we can begin to tell that story, but we also want to do so humbly and in a way that reflects the many different ways that people try to create good and the many different time horizons they try and uh, do that on. But right. I, think it, I think a tension that's going to be inherent is, you know, there is definitely, you know, a push in the sector for measuring outcomes and paying for performance. And I think one of the questions we got in ahead of time actually was from an organization that is trying to produce change in the legal system. And they're feeling that, you know, the way they were being asked, the questions they're being asked to fill out their profile really didn't do justice to the complexity of the nature of their work. And that is, I think advocacy work particularly is the most difficult to fit into this, this strict output effectiveness, you know, outcomes frame. And one of the things we think is important about this is that in bringing Foundation Center and GuideStar together, we are helping to ensure that the historic data that both these organizations have, have and the future information insights we will create uh, are being done by people who are from the sector. I mean, we both come from the sector, Jacob and I, and a lot of our team comes from the sector. And we're specialists in understanding this kind of idiosyncratic uh, sector, which has a lot of different subsectors within it. And we have, I think, part of our responsibility to the sector is to not be too reductionist about the way we see things like success and failure and outcomes and effectiveness and really do justice to all the nuance of the sector. So I don't want to end this webinar without talking about pricing. That is top of mind for everyone. Are we going to relook at pricing? When will that be? And how will that be communicated? Yeah, there's no plans as, at least nothing that I've seen in any of the, the documents that, and there's thousands of pages of them, that, that were involved in putting this together, had any discussion of price increases. Um, both organizations, um, always look at their prices in terms of costs. Um, we're yes, we're nonprofits, uh, but the fact that we're nonprofits, you know, our landlords don't treat us any differently. Our health insurers don't treat us any differently than they would a for-profit company. So we have costs, and we will make periodic price adjustments based on our real cost of 
producing goods and services. But again, um, there are no plans because of this fact that we're coming together to immediately increase prices or no delayed um, plan to do that. And we have a commitment to really make sure that the overwhelming majority of the information we provide continues to be provided for free. Great. Um, and a really fun question came in that I thought was good to follow a pricing question with, which is uh, who would you each name as a celebrity spokesperson for Candid, if you could? Uh, wow. Neil deGrasse Tyson, um, great. the great astrophysicist um, and science communicator. As someone who's just able to help the world understand how numbers add up to meaning. Wow. <laughs> Maybe uh, Tim Berners-Lee. All right. Uh, let's uh, open that up on Twitter as well. Feel free to tweet in your uh, celebrity spokesperson recommendations. Uh, I am as curious as anyone to hear who you would all say. Um, all right. So I want to I want to give you each a minute for some quick closing thoughts. Anything else that you might want to share with our audience, um, and then I'll share a few wrap up on like, oh no, my question wasn't answered. What do I do, and where do I go? Um, so Brad, why don't you start us off? Yeah, I, I want to come back to something we've it's been sort of laced through and we've touched on it, but really the the global potential for this kind of work. This is the the social sector is a global phenomenon. Um, it has incredible opportunity, but it's also, uh, you know, it's facing significant challenges. Um, in a lot of countries, space is being shut down for uh, nonprofits and other kinds of social organizations to freely associate and freely exist. Um, but we also see that more and more there are academic centers, research centers, nonprofit centers, foundation centers sort of spurting up in different parts of the world that really want to collect the same kind of information that GuideStar and the Foundation Center have been able to collect. So we feel there's enormous opportunity, rather than sort of reproduce ourselves in other countries, to work with those kinds of partners and be able to exchange the know-how we have, some of the tools, some of the platforms, and begin to stitch together a much more cohesive picture about what this social sector is capable of doing around the world. And we also think that's a really good way to defend the sector and make sure it continues to have the freedom to operate in the way that it needs to, to make the world the kind of place we want to live in. And you know, to build on that, there's a phrase Brad used earlier, which is a whole greater than the sum of its parts. And that's a phrase we've been using a lot lately it, because that's what we're trying to do is to bring together two organizations so that Candid is greater than GuideStar Plus Foundation Center. Um, but I just think it's worth emphasizing, the only reason we do that is to help the broader social sector be greater than the sum of its parts. Yeah. The, the sole reason we exist is to serve the broader field. And we have opinions about the best way to do that, um, but that is our, that, that's why we're here. Um, and I can only hope that we live up to that responsibility and we invite all of you to, as you have today, and we've got lots of questions to look through and learn from, um, to make sure that you share uh, with us how we can do that best. All right, so in wrap up, um, a few things. Some of you have asked, is there a new website? Where do I go to learn more? Um, you can go to candid.org, um, which is a splash page. It is not a full on website. Uh, both GuideStar and Foundation Center's websites are still alive and well. Um, but we wanted to kind of roll up the key information onto Candid.org. And on Candid.org, you'll find a link to the press release that announced um, us joining forces and also a bunch of frequently asked questions that we've been getting. Um, so if your question wasn't asked, please start there. Um, but if you still have a question, uh, we have answers. Email answers at candid.org um, with anything that we didn't get to. Um, you can also tweet us any questions. We'll try to be pretty responsive. Um, if you're running a conference or an event and you want someone from Candid there, we should definitely talk. And you can email me directly at jen.bokoff, B-O-K-O-F-F, -F, at candid.org. My inbox is a mess 
thank you for your patience. Um, I want to thank Ariel, who did all of the behind the scenes work to make this um, logistically sound webinar. Um, that is always a treat when things go as planned, so thank you. Uh, I want to thank Brad and Jacob, obviously. Um, it's always a delight and really appreciate your transparency. Um, I'm looking forward to more of these. Um, and we also wanted to make sure to thank our staff who has been keeping things going so smoothly. We hope that that's been everyone else's experience, but we're just so, so like floored that everything has been going exactly as planned and the ship has been sailing um, even through all of this change. So thank you very much. And I'll close with um, my celebrity spokesperson is Yara Shahidi. I don't know if you all know her, but she's an incredible young actress who is mobilizing young voters to register to vote. Um, and I think she's the next wave. And I think part of what's really exciting about Candid is that it's for people who know about nonprofit work and people who are just getting started. So thank you, everyone. We're looking forward to more of these. And we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Jen.